welcome to another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the indie publishing industry. Today, I've got my host, Jason Lavelle, back again. Hey, Jason, how you doing? Hello, YouTube. Oh, yeah. Rock on. <laughs> And I've got, got two, two authors, authors to introduce, introduce you today. One of them is actually an author and an editor, Dorothy Zemack, right? Is that, I said that right? Yes, that's right. All right, well, go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is Dorothy Zemack, and I am both an author and an editor. I started out in nonfiction with, with educational materials, and that's still what I write. I write textbooks. Probably nobody watching has read anything I've written. And I also do editing of textbooks, mostly for, for big five publishers and university presses. And then I also do editing for indie fiction writers. That's my, that's my fun stuff. Yes, and she's actually my editor. And I, I worship her. I thank her every time that she works on my projects because they're usually pretty nasty. Not really. <laughs> I still can't use a comma to save my life after all these years. You don't have to. That's what I'm for. <laughs> I can use way too many commas. You can always count on me for that. Right? For, for every writer who doesn't have enough, there's another writer who's generating extra ones, and we just take them and redistribute them, and everybody's fine. It's the Shatner approach, you know, the, the stilted speech, the comma every few uh, That is an actual linguistic term now, the Shatner comma to, for the non-standard pauses in his pronunciation. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to lay claim to that now. I use the Shatner comma. <laughs> in writing. <laughs> But Katie, if you use the Shatner comma, then no one will know when to pause the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, see, and that's what I've got you for, though. You always exactly. help me out and figure out where to pull them out of. <laughs> and uh, let me also introduce our second author of the week, author Mark Johnson, who has the Passage of Hellfire series. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Mark. I write that, but I also write anything from... Uh novellas to shorts and all sorts of genres like horror and sci-fi so whatever i feel like writing i just write okay that's cool play around in all the different genre pools you know i want to do all sorts of things so it's probably bad if you want to be like a full-time writer so don't do what i do but i do i do love it and you know i i, I write too because i have fun money is secondary as bad as that apparently sounds no that's perfect but you're doing what you what you want to do and when you want to do it so that's a good thing do you write more uh, than yeah. one series at a time or do you finish one series and then move on to the next series the way i work is i write one series in the book and either while i'm waiting for edits or in between books then i'll write something else although the next thing i plan to write i guess will be in the same world as my uh ghosting novella so i guess that'll be another series i don't know i haven't decided yet I mean, you gotta write what you feel it's it, you know for authors and i think jason you might agree too that it's it's an escape for us as well you know it's kind of like mm -hmm. downtime we get to get out of our world and into something else and you know you write what you would want to read definitely yeah. definitely well I, I write what i want to watch i don't know if that matters okay. i watch a lot of tv and movies <laughs> but, uh, what genre of uh tv series do you like to watch are you more of like a comic book guy, sci-fi, horror? I mean, I'll watch anything from like Mr. Robot to Supernatural to The Good Place to Empire. I write, I watch all sorts of stuff. Like I, I pull a lot of my influences from TV and video games. So I just love stories. It doesn't matter the medium that's told. Comic books, uh, whatever, plays, whatever. So what kind of games do you play? Right now I'm playing the Star Trek MMO and, and Child of Light on the Vita, but... I've kind of, because I'm busy, there's a whole bunch of things happening. I haven't had much time to game. So, uh, yeah, that's it. But I play Hearthstone. It's a terrible game. I do, like, I, like, play board games. I don't know if you can see my bookshelf right there, but it's, like... That's an shocking. impressive collection. Uh, that's not even all my stuff. Some of my games are at my other friend's house. But, yeah. I don't know. I love games, too. Sign of a creative mind. <laughs> exploring other worlds and stuff. I know my husband's a big gamer. I haven't been able to play many games since EverQuest days, which were like probably 10 years ago. I used to be big into gaming then, but it took up so much time I wasn't able to like focus on anything else. And I don't know if it's ADD or not, but it's I'm a one thing or another type person, so I end up giving 100% focus towards one thing and games just took up way too much of my life. Well, they say as you get older that it's more difficult to divide your attention between things. I'm That's because you got 
kids and kids. <laughs> got kids running around. And <laughs> Jason's always got to pick on me. You're older than me, dude. <laughs> are you all older than me? <laughs> uh, I don't know. How old are you? I, I don't know. I just look young, but I'm pretty old, I guess, as people say. Well, no, I'm, 30, I'm 34. 34? I've got, I've got grudges older than you. Oh, wow. Well, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Katie's turning 40 this year, and I'm 36. Oh, so. <laughs> oh, so you are all old. No. <laughs> lies, all lies. How did that even start? Why do you always pick on me for age? I, do I look that old? Do I don't you see know. My <laughs> no, but I, I think that's because you're broadcasting in like 560 instead of 1080. But. Well, that's because I don't have a good webcam yet. <laughs> one of these days, man, one of these days. <laughs> I got to sell more books. <laughs> It would just all, always crack me up because the only um, when I when I first met you on online, the only pictures that I'd ever ever seen of you were your little profile picture. Yes, I'm gonna have to find that and pop this up here, but it's like a little glamour shot where you're like, oh, and, that one. And I like you, that. you look picture, like you're yeah. 19, <laughs> and then I saw you and I was like, oh, she's she's a grown up. <laughs> oh, so that's his nice way of saying, oh, you look much older than 19. <laughs> <laughs> but you still look very nice. You're know, gonna have to get a little work done there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe when the movie rights to the Immortalis series go. Yeah, someday. Actually, no. I want to sell the Chronicles, not the Immortalis series. Mm. The Chronicles Chron that, that I think need to be sell turned both. into sell a. Both. That would be cool. Now, speaking of that, talking about you know turning books into TV series. Uh, Mark, you said you like to watch a lot of TV. Would you ever consider selling rights if you were optioned to make your you know book series into a TV series? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I do like money because I'm poor, but I'm also a control freak. I guess that's why I went the indie route. So I probably, I probably would, but I don't know. I, I don't know. It depends on like what networks, what I like. See, I know I have like no power, so I can't negotiate anything, but. I don't. You know what? I'll just say yes. I guess. <laughs> so if anyone's out there, the answer is yes. <laughs> that, was the, that was a question brought up by a guest two weeks ago. We had Madison Daniel on, and he had posed the question of if you were approached with, let's say, fifty thousand dollars to sell the rights to your book, um, and again, you have no control over. It. You're selling the rights for them to turn it into a film. Would you do it? So, and for me, I would say yes, like in a heartbeat. Go ahead and do it because as long as I've got that adapted by and my name on there, I'm good to go. Yeah, yeah. but you don't want them to like adapt it in the crap, right? You want to want it to be good. All I know is that fifty grand would pay off my Harley and my minivan. <laughs> yeah, my minivan needs a lot of work, so fifty grand I wouldn't have to worry about it, and you know I could probably send my kids to preschool. <laughs> so yeah, I I'd sell my rights. I can and your and your books would still exist as your books. So if somebody was interested in your world and the TV show wasn't exactly like the book, they would still find your books. Whereas without that additional exposure, they might never find your books. Yeah. The exposure True. factor is very big. But I mean, it's still like attached to your name, right? Like I would hate something bad to be attached to my name. I, I got a huge ego. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I know Stephen King has talked about some of his adaptations, and he's not like that. He's like a big name. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I feel like King is a perfect example too of someone who has half of his movies have ended up total crap, and and the other ones ended up fantastic movies. And and it's kind of like, man, you know, it would be yeah. that would be tough, you know, when you're when you're taking a great story and turning it into a film, and you have no idea what they're going to do with it. But then you get that exposure, though, of people going, "Well, is the book really that way?" And then they go and read it, and then you've got the debates online of how great the the book was compared to the movies. That, that's actually a good so. point. If I, if I saw a movie particularly that I didn't like, I don't know that I'd rush out to get the book in hopes that it would be different. That's well, true. I feel the same. Example, there was Katie, a... Katie's wrong. That's all there is to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So last year, a show, I believe, is on the Sci-Fi channel called The Magicians, or was that MTV that did it? I'm not sure which channel it was now. Anyways, The Magicians. I hated the TV show. I thought maybe the you know first couple episodes were great. I didn't like the direction it took, but it got me curious about the premise of the, the story. And I went and looked at the books afterwards, even though I didn't particularly like the way the show had gone. But if you ask people, are there 
books that you've read that you've seen the movie of where you thought the book was better everybody has a hundred examples but ask how many books are there that you've seen the movie of where you thought the movie was better and i i, I can think of one ever I can I can think of two, and it, it's funny because there's, there's, both... there's more in the other direction. Where you yeah, there was, was better than far them. more. Yeah, and there's ones where I thought, okay, they were different, but I like them both. Mm -hmm. But I think there's only been one where I thought, wow, the movie was actually better than the book. Yeah, hmm. interesting. So tell us about uh, about what you do, Dorothy. Ah, what do I do? I would say my 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 life is pretty much split almost 50-50 between editing and, and writing, and then the editing is split between the academic textbooks and the indie novelists that I work with. And I have, it sort of fell out this way, and I'm happy it did, that I have sort of one, one author for, for each genre. I have a thriller writer, I have Katie doing her paranormal stuff, I've got an erotic romance author, I have someone who does uh, literary fiction and historical fiction, and I just picked up a new adult contemporary romance authors so they're all they're all very different okay well that's and, fun and um a number of them well probably all of them are very prolific <laughs> uh my, my thriller writer probably sends me a, a book every month a month and a half oh wow he's cranking them out and they're all good <laughs> yeah that's awesome a future james patterson there yeah yeah well he's he's co-authored with clive custler i don't know that he's going to co-author anymore after wow. that i think three four books and, and or two two or three I don't, I don't know how many he did with clive and then went back to his own stuff katie's reasonably prolific with her stuff where we just finished off the pretty little werewolf series and there's more wolves coming up i don't know how much of her plans i can give away i, I usually send you a book what every two to three months something like that yeah i like authors that that i have an ongoing relationship with that we come to know each other's styles i know you know i, I get a style sheet i know their writing i know what problems to look for. I know what things are, are not going to change. I remember who's been named what in previous books, uh, who's got what eye color. I do some continuity stuff as well. And also we just get more comfortable with the editing and we can be, I, I find that I can be more direct. I mean, for me, somebody's novel is, is not them. It is a thing like a, a table or a piece of wood and I'm, I'm sanding it down to make it better. Okay. Where, sometimes for the author it's like a piece of their soul <laughs> and they don't always like to have their soul rubbed real hard yes <laughs> but once we get used to each other and they understand that i respect their writing and i enjoy the book but what i'm doing is trying to you know polish it up a bit then we can i think work faster and more efficiently okay now now tell me a little bit about you know what you do as an editor because i i think that a lot of us don't exactly know what to look for in an editor so tell right. me a little bit are, about course, how are, that there works are, there are different kinds of editing for textbooks i do developmental editing and that's that's very big picture stuff and i don't even look for spellings or typos because that's all going to go off to a copy editor somewhere else and there are developmental editors who work with, with indie writers as well who are looking at kind of big picture plot character stuff that's not really my favorite stuff to do I mean, what's nice to me about indie fiction is you have all these authors who are writing kind of whatever they please, and all those readers out there who I mean, have more of a choice. I mean, I think when you, had, when you had fewer indie writers, publishers would say, well, let's have more of these books because these books sell. But those books sell because those books are what are for sale. Right. And people would say, oh, you know, vampires are over, so we're not going to have any more vampires. And then indie writers are like, well, I still love vampires. And they put them out and guess what? People are still buying vampires. So I don't like to interfere that much <laughs> with an author's idea. It's their story. I'll say, you tell your story and I will make it sound the way you want it to sound. And it'll sell or it'll not sell on its own merits. So if somebody wanted bigger, more structural stuff, they'd probably go to a different editor. So what I do when I get a book is I, I put it on my Kindle. I, you know, I run it through vellum, put it on my Kindle. I read it in the bath for a couple nights. There may or may not be a glass or two of wine involved. So I just, so I get the story. Because then when I go back through it, I don't want to be distracted by not knowing what the ending is or, or, or I don't want to be swept away by the plot while I'm trying to look at, at, at more structural issues. And it also helps to know, 
you know, if, if, if something's too much of a red herring or we don't have enough character development, I need to know how the book ends before I, I get back into it. Then I'll do two passes and I'll go through first looking for kind of larger language issues. Do two characters sound the same? Sometimes beginning writers, when they're writing conversations, won't use contractions. But when people speak, it's very rare to not use contractions. Katie's sometimes a non-contraction user. So, well, although I'm... Characters who are really old, so... It's not an age thing. You Just can like her. Listen. You can go listen to a distinguished professor, and they're going to be contracting will and won't. They're going to be contracting woulds, coulds, and shoulds. And there are certain words that do get contracted and certain words that don't. And since I come from a, a background in linguistics and language acquisition, that's something I'm aware of. So, so I'll fix up things like that. For some of my authors, I do light fact checking. My thriller writer sets people in different countries. And so I think, well, okay, is this a plausible Ukrainian first name? And I would check on that. If it's not a plausible Ukrainian first name, then we would change it. And I, I had a two week argument with him once on whether or not his, his character while escaping from the bad guys somewhere in Uruguay or Paraguay would sit on a kayak or in a kayak. I won. <laughs> so so I, I, I do that kind of fact checking. If someone runs through the subway in Prague at 3 a.m., well, we have to know is the subway in Prague actually open at 3 a.m.? You know, any of those little things, because you're going to have one reader come by who's going to know if you are wrong. Oh, yeah. And once, you, and once you find one mistake in a book, then you spend all your time looking for mistakes and you're not enjoying the story anymore. So you want it to be mistake free so that the reader just doesn't even think about that kind of thing. And they're just swept along with the story, not trying to edit it as they read it. So after I do one pass like that and I, I send it back full of track changes to the author and then we negotiate stuff and I say, you know, this, your heroine actually sounds kind of bitchy. Is that really what you were going for? If it isn't, then how can we adjust it so that she doesn't come across that way? And then I'll go back and, and, and look at, on a second pass, and look at, at more specific things. I come down on Katie for, for uh, overusing some words sometimes <laughs> in her um, werewolf series, because they're high school girls, right? There are lots of kind of snark and temper tantrums and whatnot, and they were huffing a lot. Yes. I and I, and I'm I, only allowed six per book now. I give her, <laughs> I give her a, 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 you have this many huffs, and after that, and if that's going to be a characteristic of one character, then we don't want it to be a characteristic of another character. Because if we've got several girls of the same age, we want their personalities to be distinct so the reader can know who is who. And so now I'll just highlight it with a, a comment feature in Word and go, Huffington Post, and Katie knows what I mean by that. <laughs> and some of them all change and say, you know, you could try this or you could try that, or I'll just mark it for her and say, no, can't have a huff here, can't have anything else, but, but she can't huff. You always do suggest good changes, though, too. In, yeah, in I'm just, just to, 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 to give the writer an idea. And, I, and it's, it's not, I don't mean to pick on Katie. Every writer I work with has words that they tend to overuse. I have, you know, there are characters who are always nodding and jogging. There are characters who are smirking and quirking. Somebody else has got everybody glancing and gazing. And there's a rhythm to their writing. So you can't take out that sentence because there would then be a hole in the rhythm. So if, if they were saying, you know, he glanced to the side, it means that they want some kind of what we call a beat between this piece of action and that piece of action, or between this piece of speech and that piece of speech. There has to be some kind of beat there. But it can't always be the same beat, or readers will go, gosh, everyone's glancing and gazing a lot. So I make a list of, well, what else could you do? You could drum your fingers on the table, you could scratch your head, you could sigh, you could sit back, you could cross your arms. And what, what other things would give that same rhythm to the prose but wouldn't sound repetitious. That kind of suggestion. And I, and I put them all on track changes and the author can accept it or, re or, or reject it. If they reject it, they have to say why and tell me what else they're gonna do instead. Because I've signaled a problem. There are a hundred ways to, to write any sentence or to solve any problem. They don't have to take my way, they just need a way. And then we look at that, if there are any outstanding questions left, we might go over a paragraph or two, but pretty much after two passes, it's ready to go off to the proofreader or the formatter or whatever whatever step comes next. Okay, so now would you describe yourself as more content editing and then... Oh, you... yeah, what, what name would I give that? Yeah. Um, line editing I've seen. Okay. Copy editing, I guess, you know. Um, to me, content editing has a very specific meaning in, in the kind of academic editing okay. that I okay. do, where it is to do with the educational system, you know, but 
So okay. I, I don't tend to use that word. Okay, and I'm, I'm curious because when I think of line editing or copy editing, I'm thinking of uh, pretty like much proofreading. Proof, proof proofreading, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I would say that I, I mean, certainly if I see a comma misplaced, I'm going to move it or stick it in. But there's generally a proofreader who comes after me anyway. Okay. So, and, and not everybody does that. And, I, and also for my, for my thriller writer, when I started with him, uh, I had to say, I can't do guns and cars. I can't, okay. I can't check whether your guns and cars stuff is accurate because I know nothing about either. I can tell a red car from a white car if I'm looking at them at the same time. But the next day, I couldn't tell you which one was white. <laughs> so really not something I can check. Okay. So I think he had another editor who was coming in and checking just his weapons. He had some okay. ex-military guy who could do that level of fact checking for him. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, most of my writers don't need that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, Mark, because you uh, just told us a few minutes ago that you're uh, a bit of a control freak. How do you work with editors, or do you use a outside editors is, for your projects? It's great for an, an editor. Uh, we love control freaks. <laughs> no, I, I, I use an editor who I love, even though she makes me cry most days. Because <laughs> <laughs> my, my thing is, I want to put out the best thing I can. Mm -hmm. I, I always hate it when people would be like, well, I don't have any money for an editor. Then I'm like, why, why are you putting it out then? Because I, yeah. I mean... Because no one's going to judge you on whether you had the money or not. It reminds me of like what Jackie Chan once said. He's a perfectionist. He'll do like 100 takes to get this little thing wrong, flipping an umbrella to catch it a certain way or whatever. But he, he, he wants to get it right because he's like, you're not going to go to the theater, every person in the theater, and be like, well, I was feeling sick that day. So I, I didn't, I wasn't in the mood. So I figure, you know, you got to hire an editor. Uh, I love her. I'm, I'm going through some edits on my fourth book now. We're trying something a little different. But yeah, I, I go through a couple passes with her, a couple of developmentals, then copy editing. And then I think I, I use someone else for proofreading. I think that's four, four or five. I, I don't know. I go through a lot of edits. I'm actually trying something new where it's cheaper on my end and it's different. Because before I would give her early drafts and they, and they would suck. <laughs> um, so now, I mean, they, they're all going to suck no matter what. But we're trying. So that way, for some strange reason, it takes me like, to warm up like half a book until I'm like in the zone. So I kept having to rewrite the entire first half. So now I, I recently set her an outline of my fourth book. And so she sent me notes back. I'm working on that from scratch. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a little different. It's, it's a little weird. I don't know how it'll work. I got to see when I'm done. I'm still yeah. I'm only a couple thousand words in. I hope what, it, what an author gives me is the best that they can do that they've worked on it and maybe they've done two drafts or three drafts or they send it to their beta readers or whatnot. And when they can go no further, then it comes to me. Yeah, that's usually when I send it to you. I've right. passed it through a couple betas. It's been through a couple different drafts. Because otherwise you're, you're, you're paying me to edit something that you're, that you're gonna change. And you're, right. you're basically paying for the book twice. Well, so. and mm. Jason can attest to it. I've sent him some betas. They're pretty gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell him, do not pay attention to the grammar right now. Just give me the story. Yeah, yeah, I will perfect yeah. the rest of it. <laughs> you know, I, I always feel, you know, people always tell me that about betas too. But then I'm like, you know what? Even though I go through my stuff several times and then I have betas go through it and then my editor go through it, I still end up catching stuff afterwards. So yeah. I think, well, if I just point out a couple things here and there, it might help in the long run, you know? And yeah. even though that might annoy the author a little bit it's like you know you even a even a good editor isn't going to catch every single thing you know it's it's there's so many words it's yeah i don't Sometimes want to say impossible but, is, is. <laughs> but for instance though let's say you know jason i sent you a story recently and uh, you didn't like how i dealt with craig so if you're was unjustly you, punished if you're giving me <laughs> a bunch of you know grammatical notes on craig's scene or greg's scene um, and then I go and change that scene completely based on yeah. your, your feedback of you didn't like how I handled him. I'm not going to use any of your grammatical notes because it's going to be completely changed before it moves on to the next step. And that's fine if you don't use them. I just I think it's kind of nice to put them in there just in case the, the author or the editor don't catch them. I don't know. Yeah. There, was, there was one gal who had sent me some beta reading a, a couple of years ago. Her name was uh, Tara Eden, and she writes a fantastic young adult fantasy series. It's, kind of, it's more of a high fantasy. 
and she had sent me stuff that had just come come out of the the copy editor and there wasn't a lot that was wrong but you know there's a half dozen you know to a dozen things in in each novel that i that i was finding and i was like okay well you know i, I know you didn't ask me for this you were just yeah. you were just wanting my opinion on overall content but if people see this you know like you said dorothy once you yeah. find a mistake in a book for whatever and reason you're out, that yeah. you're focused on that stuff and and i don't know you know if somebody finds a mistake in one of mine regardless of what stage it is it's like well just tell me you know even if i'm going to rewrite that page you know that way i know i'm not going to f it up the next time around <laughs> or if i will at least, if i do at least i had some warning yeah if it's a comma problem i'll still screw it up <laughs> yeah that, and i use the word though far too much uh, according to my editor it's yeah it's yeah, yeah. Hmm. You guys work a little differently than I do. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't give my manuscript that I'm happy with to my editor. That's 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 only when I when I publish, then I'm happy. I bet but you're happy. Hey, that's all. That, yeah, however you get there, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, I always looked at it like a class, an expensive class. But, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say that yeah. sounds expensive, man. But I mean, my editor, she she brought up a lot of lessons. Some I need reminding where I, I like learn things, and she helps me, particularly the early drafts where I'm stuck on something because I'm like I don't know where to go with this. I even say like in my outline, I think I was like I don't know where I go. I wanted this to happen, and but I don't know how I'll get there. She'll give me ideas, and then I'll be like, damn, why didn't I think of that? And then I'll just I'll roll with it. I don't always roll with her suggestions, but a lot of the times I do. But I, but I think that's an important point. I mean, there, there's no one right way to edit any more than there's one right way to be an author. You need to find an editor who gets you, that you're comfortable working with. If you gave the same book to 10 different editors, you'd get back 10 different versions. Mm -hmm. That would well, all be fine, but they'd be different. So as an author, you've got to find an editor that you feel is making your book the way you want it to be. And that's why when you're choosing an editor, they say, do a sample edit. I mean, any editor should give you, I don't know, two, three pages, you know, a thousand words or so free. So you can test each other out. And if you're not happy with the results you get back, it doesn't mean that they're a, a bad editor, but it might mean they're not a good editor for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody's got a different style. I know there was that one time I worked with a different editor and I came crawling back to Dorothy, <laughs> going, please edit my next book, please, 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 because I was so used to working with you, Dorothy, and I yeah. know your style, and you know my style, and, and we've worked together for how many years now? I don't know, two, three? Probably more or than more, that. Really? You've you re edited Carpe Noctum. That's true. That's true. So okay. You've edited pretty much every single book that I've got in my collection, so <laughs> that's at least a good five, six years. <laughs> wow, I was in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Katie was just in her uh, early 40s then. <laughs> But that's why a lot of editors who are experienced are booked up because we get the same authors and and we commit to them. And I, you know, I know what Russell's going to do next year. You know, he says I'll just do eight books. I know it's really going to be ten or twelve, and and so I, I block out that time for him. I know Katie's going to have a certain number of books. I know my my erotic romance girl's going to have her number of books, and those are the people that I want to work with. So it's it's if I'm going to take on a whole new author, <laughs> there would be a an audition sort of stage for both of us, right? <laughs> but if you're going to entrust your novel that, I mean, no matter how fast you write, it's a lot of hours of work. It's effort and it's emotion and it's work. You certainly want to give it to somebody who's going to help make it into your dream of what a great book would be. So it is, it is an important choice. And you, you do want to find someone that can bring your vision to life and then stick with that person. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and if one, if one doesn't work, then, I mean, it's, it's like with covers. How many times do we change covers on books? If one cover is a great cover, but it's not quite working, then you would redesign it and go with another one. Yeah, and that's... The that's banner behind me is all, all covers <laughs> that no longer exist because they've been redesigned. I'm struggling through that as well. My, my second novel, Delia, which I absolutely love. It's kind of a biopic story that goes from world war ii and on and follows this woman's life lots of drama tons and tons of action and my original our original cover i hated i didn't like it at all and it wasn't provocative it didn't grab the eye at all so you know a, a friend of ours alexia redid the cover and now with a new cover i've got quite a bit of response to saying that you know i i just don't like that cover it just doesn't speak to me oh, so no. now i'm kind of like 
damn it, where in the hell now do I go with this yeah. now? Because I liked the new cover. <laughs> and people are saying, go back to the old cover, but I hated that old cover. So it's like, well, shit, I'm, I'm just going to start from scratch here and, and see what happens. But, yeah, you know, I think I was just, just, being... just going through that with uh, with Katie. I sent her two covers and said, "Which one do you like better?" I I thought I have I have so many strong opinions on 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 grammar and and writing and indie writers and whatnot. I thought you know what I should take all my strong opinions and my rants and I should make myself a little grammar book. So I oh I, nice writing my grammar for indies book of of things that I would want independent fiction writers who don't have to deal with a publishing house, who don't have to deal with a house style, who are responsible for their own decisions, but also working with an editor. What do I want them to know about grammar? Oh, and, fantastic. And, and then I thought, okay, well, I need, I need a cover. And my designer gave me two covers and they're both very different. And I thought, hmm, well, I, I, I like this one. No, I like this one. So I put it up in, in you know, some closed Facebook groups and pretty much everyone said, wow, I like this cover best. I'd buy that one. Now, do you want me to share those yeah, covers? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and share the covers. There's the one that everybody likes, and then there's the one that everybody would buy. The two covers, you can see the the different styles on, on each side. And and for my opinion, if you want mine. Uh, well, let's, I, let's, let's, let's ask Mark there, because he, he's oh. an author. So Mark, if you, were, if you wanted to learn more grammar, which <laughs> one of those do you like better? And which one would you buy? And I'm not, it's not written yet, so you can't buy it. Okay. It's, not, it's not a sales pitch. I, I don't want to, I don't want to actually learn more grammar, by the way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, he's got an editor for all that. Yeah. Um, let me see. Let's see. I, I like the one on the right more, but I don't like the font. I just like the, the picture. You know, when I, when I, when I'm trying to decide like book covers and things, yeah. I actually don't solicit from like writer people I know or people in the genre. I, I have like marketing and business friends who uh -huh. I'm pretty close with. And I always go for their opinions because they're not immersed in that. And, yeah. And yeah. They have like more of a, more of a bigger picture. And then they'll just look at me with like, Oh yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking, why didn't I think of that? So what other authors said, and of course other authors actually are my target audience here is everyone liked the tree. But they said they'd buy yeah. the plain boring one because it looked yeah. more serious. You know, I, I think it's of... the I think it's the font though. And maybe the, the background. One? Yeah, I think the picture works, but like if you put the tree in the white, like you kind of mishmash them together, I think it would it would probably work. But I don't know. I don't know. I think the tree is really cute, but the other one looks legit. Yeah. Looks yeah. More believable. Yeah. 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 So we'll see. I got to. I got to finish. Every time I try to finish writing it, some author gives me a, a novel to work on. So, <laughs> but I. But but I. What I wanted to do also was was to take example. I get frustrated with grammar books that have made up examples. My pet peeve is the passive, where someone will say, "The boy threw the ball" is a better sentence than "The ball was thrown by the boy." Well, of course. Of course it is. I mean, the ball was thrown by the boy is a stupid sentence, but nobody's writing that as a passive, and it's a stupid passive. But if you wrote a good passive sentence, it would be better than a stupid active sentence. But if you're just looking at fake language, that those distinctions don't come out. I mean, if someone says, you know, kangaroos are found in Australia, that doesn't sound odd to you. Whereas if someone said, a bunch of people whom you don't know and aren't important to our story, if they were in Australia, could find kangaroos there, that sounds weird. So what I wanted to do was take examples from indie authors who are selling and use those as examples to say, look at what these authors are doing and from a whole bunch of different genres. Here's how they're handling dialogue tags. Here's how they're handling the presence or the absence of adverbs. Here's how they're handling conversation and sentence fragments and, and passive so, so that people are, are working with language examples from actual books of the same type that they write. Katie's got some examples in there. She doesn't know which ones I picked yet, but oh okay. no, now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but all the examples I, I wanted to show are good examples. Oh, okay. I mean, of things that work. Is if the passive is okay, then we need to see examples of where the passive would be a better choice than the active, and you need to see that in context in a novel, not in yeah. some weird made-up sentence. Speaking of the the standards of of editing. A long time ago said was the the word that you should use for everything they didn't want you to have creative dialogue tags but i think the more creative the comes, dialogue that comes, tags, that comes in and out of fashion i mean i y'all are 
joking about age and I'm thinking, you have no idea. <laughs> I, I grew up on the older Nancy Drew books. And if you read, and I, I don't know what the current, because they, they, you know, revise them every five years or so to make them current. But at the, at, at the time that I was reading them in the 60s and the 70s, everything was, you know, remarked, retorted, queried. I mean, it wasn't a said in the whole book and that's what everybody read and it seemed normal and then that sort of went out of fashion and now everyone's using said and occasionally and asked and responded and that's kind of a trend thing and I don't I don't know that one way is better than another I think you have to know what your readers are reading and what they expect and follow what readers are expecting and if your readers are going to freak out seeing a Nancy Drew treatment of queried responded you know chortled then, then don't do it because you're going to be pulling them out of the story. Uh, but I honestly I, think readers don't care about any of that. They may not. They, and that might be the kind. The thing is that some of these things like the LY adverbs are so easy for someone to hunt for with a computer program that you feel that you're being, that you're working hard, that you're doing something because you asked it to find every word with LY and you found a whole bunch of them and you took them out for I don't know what reason and you feel like you've done work. But I don't think a reader is going to notice yeah. That, yeah. I mean, no readers going. What do you mean? He said softly. Why didn't Why didn't the author say whispered there? There's no reason that that said softly is worse than whispered. Yeah. Well, and I kind of agree <laughs> with with both you and Martha. I I feel like, especially with dialogue tags, I feel like a reader's eye will kind of skip over them. It, it's yeah. Just, yeah. It's, Become you second need to know nature. who's talking. You have to be able yeah. to tell who is who. But and you it, do that with with paragraph indents. You do that with the content of what they're actually saying. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to indicate who is speaking. Oh, yeah. And if it's a conversation with a lot of people or if, if it gets complicated, then obviously you need to differentiate between them. But for the most part, you know, there'll be sometimes where I'll, I will use zero dialogue tags. If, if I want it to flow faster, you know, yeah. if, if yeah. I want oh, yeah, to speed absolutely. up the eye. I mean, um, uh, re reading, e whether it's an ebook or a print, is, is very visual. I mean, it's different mm -hmm. from an audiobook. And when you have short lines one after another that don't wrap yeah it, it it's a faster pace and oh, if you yeah. put said bob said mary said bob said mary it's going to slow the reader down just a bit so mm -hmm. if you want the kind of you know beat 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 you know witty repartee where in actual conversation people would even be overlapping yeah then you want shorter lines yeah and i and i do that a lot too when i'm getting to um any kind of tense scene or, or action scene where I will make a conscious effort to shorten my sentences yep. a little bit more and more as, as I'm getting into yep. it because I want their that's eye to have up, to really go fast. That's going to pick up your so, pace. you got to yeah. think also that a lot of people reading ebooks, they're reading on smaller screens. Yeah. So long paragraphs that, that would take up maybe a, a third of a page on paper you can now go on to scroll screens. through a couple times. And yeah. it's just like, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall of text. It's just too much for the eye to take in. So when I'm editing people that I know are 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 writing most are selling mostly ebooks, we go for shorter paragraphs too. Just okay. to, you know, as as a visual thing to help people along. Well, well and that's a that's a good thing to um to think about too, what you just said about it being very visual visual and if you look at your document as you're writing and you're seeing that you've got these big blocks of text, even if it can all go in one paragraph, I will go Must through it. and it, yes. yeah. Yeah, and I'll, <laughs> I'll go through and I'll go, okay, I'm going to break up this paragraph a little. That way it, it, it's a little bit easier for the eye to take in because, you know, sometimes yeah. those big, thick block paragraphs can be intimidating even to a reader. And they're like, oh, man, I just right. want to get to the next piece of dialogue or I want to get to the next also, piece of It's action. also a, a cue. Most people associate really long paragraphs with nonfiction. Yeah. And so if you have a long descriptive scene in your novel, but you're not nonfiction, you still want it to look like a story and a narrative. And so you want to look like, like what you are. So yeah, divide your paragraphs if, if necessary. Now, I know we've been thick into the editing now, but I wanted to um, ask Mark. Mark, tell me about the series that you're writing. <laughs> uh, I'm really bad at this pitch. I thought a couple of weeks ago I had my first table at a convention that I would have been able to uh, perfect it by then. Dude, you need to watch the episode with Armand Rosa Milio. Is that right, oh, Katie? Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, this guy is like a genius with coming up with the short pitches. But but anyhow, okay. Give us your oh well. I mean, pitch. Um, my my series though it's um, it's high fantasy. 
you know, it's it's pretty, at least the first book starts out kind of stereotypical. You know, it's about a young boy. He has powers and he has to learn about responsibility and trying to help people. And there's a romance and destiny and magic and stuff involved. <laughs> uh, I like to think Dude. it gets a, a little more <laughs> interesting. <Yeah. laughs> right, my bitch is horrible. My bitch is horrible. Don't uh, call your book stereotypical. Okay, here we go. Let's let's stop right there. All right, what was the three part of the pitch here? I don't know. I'm very nonchalant about things. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty bad. What, what if I wait like it's Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings? You know, you can do that though. You can I'm do in. That. I'm in right now. Yeah, I guess. I, I pitch my, uh, my Gladiator series. I say it's Interview with the Vampire meets Hunger Game and Russell Crowe's Gladiator. Yeah, it's, instead well, of stereotypical, you want to say it starts with a familiar and it brings you from oh, the okay. known into the new or something. I don't well, know. And what was it that Sean Hode was saying? He said, you know, pick out some elements that you know people are going to recognize. He said Star Trek and Lord of the Rings. Obviously, anyone who's who likes fantasy knows what those are. So... I think that's a perfectly acceptable way to get into it. Yes. It's like Star Trek meets Lord of the Rings with this and this. Well, well those I, are so polar it, opposites. Now you're going, well, how did you get those concepts together? Yes. Uh, I actually said Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings. Oh, what did uh -oh. I say? Are, are you a Star Trek versus Star Wars guy? I mean, Star Trek's better. But <laughs> I, I grew up with Star Trek, so I love okay. Star Trek, but I love Star uh, Wars too. Here, here's an idea for a new series: and Star Wars meets Star Trek meets Lord of the Rings. Right back. <laughs> I like it. I like this it. Why, this you know, why Luke, I'm not an Luke Skywalker versus uh, Captain Kirk, and then Gandalf is like up there doing. I don't know what he'd be doing, but would he be gotta, number one? Would he be? <laughs> he's or would he the be Rogue the One character. <laughs> Oh, anyhow, we kind of got off track there as we were picking <laughs> oh, on the mark. Oh, that's fine. My, my pitch is terrible. Maybe if I was more uh, as seasoned as you guys, I would be a little better. Oh, shit. Uh, but, Damn. He just burned you, Katie. <laughs> yeah, I got I to gotta work on it. It's, it's very, I don't know, it's very hard for me to do. I did post a thread about it in the Writer's Cafe once. I think my problem is I look at the the bigger picture or the each book like my mind is i don't know it's like on the fourth book or fifth book and then i gotta i guess explain only the first book and not spoilers i'm i'm pretty good at tv shows i can do this but i can't do this on like my own work so what are you gonna do it, it is hard to distill down you know eighty five thousand words into one sentence it, it's really difficult to do and you want to give so much more details because the story is so huge but yeah. you know, if you're selling it to somebody, you've got to find that way. You've got to you know, bring it down to something quick and easy and snappy that makes people go, really, tell me more. And then you kind of hand them the book and say, well, read the back, read the synopsis. Yeah. Well, and just a month ago, after that Armand uh, episode with, uh, it was him and Josh, right? Yeah. I actually went back and forth with, with Katie and the guys that had been on the show and said, you know, help me come up with a little log line for my new book because I I was right there with you, Mark. I was absolutely horrible at coming up with these. Now, I will say I'm not quite as horrible as, as what you told us, but <laughs> it's still pretty bad. <laughs> so, you know, Katie is actually really good at coming up with these catchy little things. It might be worth, you know, dropping her a line and saying, you know, you know, help me out with this because that, that's really what it's all about, and that's why we do this, is so that we can help each other and that so that other people can learn and say, you know, it's it's all right to have somebody help you out, especially if you're just not feeling it. You know, you want to focus on your story. And I, and I think that just from chatting with you for the last, you know, 45 minutes or so, it's really clear that you're not... You don't you don't want to do all the the grammar and, and that kind of crap. You want to you want to create your story. You want to create your people in your world and I think that's great. So just make sure that you're pulling in those other people around you to to really be a support for you. I mean, we're all here to help each other. Another, another person you can hand your blurb to is your editor who of course by the time he or she is done with your book has read your book and knows it intimately and and could say, "Oh, well that's not really what grabbed me most about your story. I would bring this out more." Yeah, that's a really good point because they've gone through your story with a fine tooth comb. They know where the key elements are. But also for the grammar <laughs> and the proofreading. I mean, I, I talk my author's blurbs on Amazon and if I see a mistake, I'll email them and say, hey, you really got to get, you know, some italics here. <laughs> well, because I care. But I think sometimes people forget to ask somebody to do that. 
when, when you start negotiating with an editor, I would make sure that you throw the blurb in or the back cover of your paperback and, and ask the editor to, to do that as well. Oh, my editor, so, she, she, she does my blurb, but she ends yeah. up writing a better blurb than I ever could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So. Well, because she's read your book, and, and, and she knows it from a reader's point of view. I feel like I want to read your books, Mark, just because <laughs> I love this kind of chill, do attitude, you chill <laughs> attitude you got. And I'm like, man, I want to read how this guy writes. I mean, well, it just sounds like it's going to be so awesome. Uh, maybe that's how I sold books. I'm better at selling them in person, I guess, because of my chill attitude. And No, it's cool. And you've got a great smile. So it's like, man, yeah, it makes me happy listening to him. So I want to read this stuff. Sit back with a beer and read some high fantasy. Uh, there you Star go. Wars kicking Star Trek's ass. What? Oh. <laughs> He's always got to be confrontational. Just tell him that you're Team Jacob and watch him just fly off the handle. Oh, no. He, he wouldn't do that. That's He probably doesn't even know what that is. That's the Twilight, dude. He's on... He's on He's on Scream Queens, I believe. He's okay <laughs> on that show. Yeah. Wow, there's so much hatred. <laughs> but see, at least I know your trigger point now, Jason. So <laughs> just, you know, poke the bear every so often. Since yeah, oh yeah. Old. <laughs> so what are, you, what are you working on right now, Mark? Are you, are you still working on that series or do you have a couple things going on? No, no, I'm, I'm, I started working on that series again, the fourth book. Um, what's interesting and a little different is the first three books are all in the uh, first person. So some things happen to my main character where this fourth book will be in uh, third person and it'll bounce around from uh, point of view, uh, different characters. So oh, cool. uh, hopefully it'll work. So we'll see if my five fans like it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean by that. <laughs> I say that all the time. My five readers, that's it. <laughs> Well, if five readers can send you to Vegas, I think you're doing okay. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want those same five readers. Uh, that was fun. Uh, I never done a convention before, and that was pretty great time. Uh, smallest convention. I didn't. I didn't know how much I would sell or if I'd sell any. No, that was pretty. I'm. I'm a pretty good salesman in person. Uh, That's awesome. I guess. It was it was it a comic con or was it a book convention? What kind of? Convention it was, was a it? small sci-fi and fantasy convolution. It only had about. I think I heard the numbers were seven, eight hundred people. Uh, I mean, I've been to like a million conventions, but never behind a table. It is also very boring when you're working by yourself behind a table. Mm -hmm. uh, don't don't do that. Don't <laughs> don't ever do that. It's always nice to have a buddy when you go to events like that. And you've got somebody to chat with during the downtime. You've got somebody who's got your back. You know, when you're getting sales, somebody to help push people towards your book. And uh, I, I don't have any friends, so. <laughs> I can be your friend. Where do you uh, live? Okay. <laughs> Near San Francisco. <laughs> no, I, I really want to take a trip out west. We gotta we've gotta make this a big thing where we have one convention that we're all committed to going to. Star Trek so, convention in Vegas. I, I love that. Oh, yes. there you go. Yes. But I think it conflicts with Gen Con. I'm gonna go next year. So what's Gen uh, Con? What do you, are you serious? Yeah, what's Gen, Gen Con? Con? It's the biggest board gaming convention in the world, but they got like RPGs, even some video game stuff, and all Jacob sorts of stuff. Jacob would probably know about that. Our our other co-host, he's actually he's on vacation right now, but he's a real big gamer, and he's actually coming up with a uh, a couple of board games of his own. I love Gen Con. I love it all, but not <laughs> being behind the table because you can't experience it. Uh, if it really sucks. People would be like, "Oh yeah, I taught this workshop on uh, how to fight as a Jedi," and I'm like. That sounds really cool. I was behind here um, <laughs> doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun going to conventions. I've done a few of the Comic-Cons this year. I'll be going to Comic-Con in Tucson next month. Me and my partners actually have a table and we're doing a panel on the first day of Comic-Con. So it'll be fun to actually kind of sit on a panel and talk about writing in front of a bunch of other people and then go back and hopefully sell some books. Do you guys like talking about writing? Me, I'm like, eh. I mean, <laughs> with you guys, I don't mind because I talk about it so rarely, but I figure everyone else talks about it all the time. Like, if I talked about something all the time, I might get tired of it, except for Star Trek. I do love Star Trek. <laughs> See, there you go. If it's something you're truly passionate about, you could probably talk for hours. And it, it depends on the company you're with, too. If you're around a bunch of writers, talking shop just comes naturally. Yeah. I never get tired talking about language or, or, or grammar or meaning or teaching or any of that. 
Maybe I'm I just like to weird. talk about tattoos. There you go. I, I haven't decided on my second tattoo. It's very tough. We can all go get some matching indie author ink. There we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm I'm busy that weekend. Oh. Have fun, you guys. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you copies of the grammar books as prizes. Yes. When when is the grammar book going to be done? Hopefully, I can finish it off in November. That's my goal. Okay, that'd be cool. I there can't wait go. for it to come out. I want to read it. Will you do your own editing, or will you have someone else? Uh... I, I'll certainly do my own editing because. I am an editor, but I'm, I will give it to a separate proofreader. There's a, a grand total of one person that I would trust who I know has similar theories and beliefs on grammar. And he was actually the one who helped me track down where indie authors get their fear of adverbs. Cause I had never heard of that before stepping into Stephen fiction. King. Exactly. And yeah. I bought a copy of his book to see where that came from. And mm -hmm. like, my goodness. You know, so I, that is actually where it started, and I can tell you that. And I like Stephen King is a fantastic writer. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's that's a controversial oh yeah, statement. I, I but he a, does not know what an adverb is. I have a lot of respect for him, but I'll tell you what. You know, his his on writing. Well, I felt like it was it was great. It was also a little bit diminutive towards uh, towards a lot of indie type writers, and of course, it was yeah. before the the indie revolution happened, but. You know, it's it's not exactly encouraging to to young writers. No, but I, I don't know that on writing is really meant to be a how to guide. It is more yeah. an in depth look at how he did it, and it's fascinating to look at his career yeah. as a writer and how many drafts he went through stuff and how much he cared and and the point where he could not tell whether a story was good or bad, but it took his wife pulling it out of the trash can to say, yeah. no, actually, I can tell that this is good. And his, you know, his personal struggles and how he wrote all the way through that. I, I'm not sure that's a blueprint for anyone to pick up and go, oh, well, I should follow this. And then I, too, will be a great author. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but as, as, as a look at, at how somebody approaches their own fiction, I, it, it's fantastic. He's right. wrong about the passive and, and he's wrong about adverbs, but, uh, but he's not a grammarian. I mean, but so so if, you, if you take that out... <laughs> What's left is a great book. You guys took that away from on writing? I always thought of it as like a memoir. I didn't really pay attention to the writing stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, That's just it, because it said memoir on the cover. Yeah. No, it was about his life. Yeah, and most of yeah. it, I was like, oh, that's really yeah. fascinating. He got hit by a car, and I don't know. Right. I was like, oh, yeah, that's he's not, he's stuff. He's not you know, advocating being hit by a car and substance abuse for, for people <laughs> you know, to go out and become good writers. It's, it's what that's what it wrote. takes. That's what you've got to do this. It's, it's what, he, what his life was like and how he managed to write you know, through that and, and with that. And, and that's I wish, fascinating. I wish this book covered one thing, because as much as I love King, he cannot do endings right. And uh, I wish he had talked about that, because, uh, yeah, his endings suck. Except for 1963, but that's because his son helped him. And his son's a pretty good writer, too. I don't know, Joe Hill? You don't really expect Mr. King to, to write about why his own endings suck. <laughs> <laughs> he, well, he, he might not think they do. Well, maybe he ran it. No, he's admitted, like, like yeah. his 1963, he was like, yeah, my son helped me, and it was a better ending. And he's admitted, like, the, the Mist, the movie, like, that ending was better than what I wrote. Mm. So he'll admit it. I think maybe he yeah. just ran out of drugs uh, at that point. <laughs> I don't know. He got sober and it ruined everything, just like the yeah. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh. So a writer has to have their vice in order to be a good writer. Mm -hmm. Apparently. Or a great writer, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. right. What are your vices then? Coffee. Coffee. Call of Duty. <laughs> Not cool. I don't have any vice. And I had a friend who said, Mark, I don't trust you because you don't have any vices. And I was just like, what the hell? But uh, I guess it's true. Well, video games and, and uh, board games could be your vice. Eh, I could do without those, though. Those are just something to stimulate my mind. There's not nothing, there's yeah, not anything I like, say really about need. cocaine, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd try, but I'm too poor. Maybe if people would buy my stereotypical <laughs> fantasy series, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm on it, buddy. I'm I'm buying it tonight. When's, when's book four going to be coming out? Uh, sometime next year. I'm a slow writer. I don't. You were like uh, Katie was like two or three months at a new draft. I'm like, damn, that's that's fast. It takes me a I'm, year to write a to write a full draft. I'm slow. Well, it depends on the word count too, because lately I've been sticking towards that fifty thousand word mark. I think. The last one, Fearless Little Werewolf, came in at 85,000, and that was a push. It probably goes faster, too, when you're unjustly um, persecuting 
people in your books. Yeah, I mean, that's so easy to do. You just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, all right. Well, I think we're running out of time. So does anybody have anything they want to bring up about uh, sales, new releases? I'll give away a grammar book if people don't mind waiting till it's written. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, I, I, I want to give away give, give away stuff, Katie. I just don't know how. So I need you to do the raffle copter. Well, we need to do something like a what would you know the whole what would you do for a Klondike bar? What would you do for a Jason Lavelle book? I'm afraid I wouldn't get very many responses. Oh, <laughs> you're supposed to have more confidence than that. Come on. My stereotypical response to that is hanging my head in shame. <laughs> What about you, Mark? Is there anything you want to pimp out tonight? Um, my second book, What Once Was One, will be available in audio later this month, uh, as soon as I, I'm done uh, approving the files. <laughs> if you buy the book on Amazon, the paperback, I think the audio book will be free. Okay. Um, uh, well, whatever that's give, called. Give us, give us a little idea of, of, about what this book is about. My, my second book? Yeah. That's... Uh, I, it's hard for me to do this without you spoiling the it. first book. Oh, well, okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. How about give us an idea of what the series is about? I did. You guys minutes. laughed at me and made fun of me. And I'm, as soon as we get off of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry. <laughs> Wait, I thought, that, I thought that that was the... Uh... This, the stereotypical one. Yeah, it's the stereotypical oh. one. That's sad. <laughs> Wait, what's the name of the second one, then? Make our, make our uh, guests. Hi. The, the title is just what once was one. The first book's called Catalyst. This, the series is just called The Passage of Hell's Fire. Okay, so your, your series is high fantasy. It's got some, does it have it some is. good action adventure stuff going on? It does. I would say it does. Okay. Um, you know the reason why I say it's stereotypical? Let me try to defend myself in the worst way. <laughs> um, I think it's because, I don't know, I, I came up with the idea when I was a kid, and this is uh, since I was 13, so I went through a whole bunch of drafts. But like when so I write five years ago, yeah, five years <laughs> ago. <laughs> so when I write stuff now, like the living remnants or ghosting or star-crossed or whatever, like I can, like my mind's free, so I'll write whatever I want. Um, but here it's it is a little more formulaic. So, I mean, I do do things a little differently, especially in the sequels. But. I don't know. It's it's weird. Once I'm done with that series and I have others' ideas, I, I just like write whatever, I free my mind or something like that. I don't know if that made any sense, to be honest. You fully immerse yourself into the world. Sure. <laughs> you gotta sell it. You gotta sell it. <laughs> I fully immerse myself in the world. We need to hang out with this guy, Katie, because he sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this will definitely be one of our, our more fun shows. Uh, well, I, I do give fun stuff. I don't make a lick of sense, and I'm terrible at selling myself, to be honest. So. Uh. Uh, well, and that's one of the things that I enjoy about doing these shows is every week we meet new people and we see new styles of how they do things, you know, new ways of finding inspiration, new ways of selling themselves, you know, like that episode with Armand and uh, Joshua, we learned about log lines and we practice log lines during the episode. So it, it's really fun to see, you know, each new author each week and their, their approach to everything. That was a much more professional show. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I ruined it. Sorry, Dorothy. I ruined it for you. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, a couple of reminders before we go. This is still October, which is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And as we promised uh, Madison Daniel, we would promote his uh, Bleed Like Me. He's doing a match. So anybody who buys his book in ebook, paperback, whatever, He's going to take all the royalties from October and match them and send them on over to the Breast Cancer Awareness Society. Yeah. Um, we'll post the link up on that. Also, Wicked Winter is still available for 99 cents. That's the one that I'd submitted the story into. And it will be published early December with all proceeds going towards the Alzheimer's Association. So we'll make sure to put those in the links at the bottom so that you can grab those books. Um, and I believe they're both on sale. I know Wicked Winter is 99 cents and it's got 15 stories in it. So it's wow. a really good deal. Ooh, can I do a giveaway on here? I don't know how this all works. Yeah, absolutely. Do it. a stereotypical oh, giveaway. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's October and it's Halloween month. I would mm -hmm. like to give away my 
pretty good uh, short story that, <laughs> that people say I should write more in that world, which I don't know if I will. The Living Remnants, it's like a, it's a zombie tale. I can go into it, but I won't. Sweet. But I, I would like people, if they want a copy, to tweet at me, which ship would win in a fight? The Defiant or the Delta Flyer? Because that has been bothering me for like the past day or so. And everyone says the Defiant, but I don't think it'd be as one-sided as people will think. I think 60-40 to the Defiant. So if you could just tweet at me, at Hellsfire. And what, then is, I, and then, what is he talking about, Defiant? It's, and... it's a Star Trek thing. Oh. This is probably like that. the weird giveaway. But yeah, no, I just, like it. I don't know. <laughs> and you're gonna pick yeah. one tweeter at random, or how many, how many giveaway, or how many copies are you gonna get? I don't know. Away? Whatever. First ten. It doesn't matter. I mean, no one will probably tweet at me, but if you do, the Defiant or the Delta Flyer. I mean, I don't. Yeah, because that's been bothering me. And what's your Twitter Twitter handle? At Hellsfire. At Hellsfire. All right. All right. Well, we'll I'll tweet at you. I'm gonna make something up. I don't. I don't want a bunch of people tweeting at me, but can I still make them do something? Sure. They have to say what their favorite word in English is. Mm. Okay. I got Shut one. I got a word. I got a oh, word. Pooty tang. <laughs> I'll take that, that. That automatically. Funky call Medina. <laughs> that automatically enters you, and you didn't even want to learn more grammar. <laughs> ah, you're getting a grammar book. <laughs> hey, I have to okay. listen to Grammar Girl. I love her. Yeah, she's great. I've got the I've got one of the Grammar Girl books. She was great. <laughs> Thanks, All right, Oprah. so in the comments below, we need to tell Dorothy what our favorite English word is. Yeah, I was gonna say part of speech, but I was afraid nobody would know any. So let's just go with Salador. word. door. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well that's it for this week. I want to thank you guys again for hanging out with us, Dorothy and Mark. Yep. You guys have been really fun to chat with. <laughs> And we'll be back next week with another episode and some more authors to introduce you to. Be sure to like our page, uh, give a thumbs up to this video, and definitely check the description because we're going to have links for giveaways. We're going to have the information about Mark's giveaway and what to do and Dorothy's giveaway and what to do. And there'll be one for Jason and how to win some copies of his book. Now, Jason, you're giving away paperbacks. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, we lost Jason. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to hide from whatever evil monster I end up editing into this. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm going to give paperbacks away. Um, you guys can just kind of decide what you want. I've got. I'll, I'll give winners choice of paperback or ebook. Yeah, or both. Who who wouldn't want their favorite grammar book immortalized in paper? But as long as it's signed, I'm I'm good. Signed. Go. Yeah, signed books. Those are those are special. So, all right, everybody, remember, check the description below to find all of this information out because there'll be a lot of information in there. And make sure that you leave a comment telling us what your favorite word is for Dorothy. And, Mark, what were the two ship names again? Uh, the USS Defiant and the Delta Flyer. That One's from DS9, the greatest Star Trek show, and the other's from the worst, Voyager. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, that's all we've got for you today. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.